Welcome back to Akamai TV. I'm Nelson Rodriguez. If you asked someone 10 years ago about the leading formats for distributing video online, you would have gotten some very strong opinions and the answers will have changed in the last 10 years. And our next guest, Jeff Malkin and his company Encoding.com have been dealing with those changes and helping companies manage their transformation. Jeff, welcome to Akamai TV. Thank you, Nelson, great to be here. So when you and I first spoke, we talked a little bit about formats. Now obviously Encoding.com and Akamai care a lot about formats. We mm -hmm. think a lot about it. Yep. We think a lot about the role that formats play in delivering great experiences. Why should anybody else care about formats? Well, I, I, honestly, you would hope that you wouldn't have to care about managing formats. Um, if you're a, a large media company, you want to maximize the number of viewers who can view your content. And of course, we know that all these different consumer devices in, in the market don't have a unified format that they've all uh, you know, unified upon. So as a content owner, you need to deal with it only in that you want to maximize revenues, make sure your content's available on, a, on as many devices in market. Um, the way that you've managed that over the years as a content owner is doing it, you know, managing it internally. And you're investing heavily in uh, hardware and software encoders and infrastructure, uh, teams of people, uh, R&D, continued R&D. But what happens is all that investment um, really becomes outdated long before uh, the investments are amortized because the formats keep changing. And that's a, that's a significant problem that we help resolve. So you talked a little bit about uh, transcoding and the way that companies are dealing with it, uh, with on-prem solutions, with hardware, with software. And obviously nowadays, most companies are aware of the need to transition away from on-prem or they're in the middle of the process. Yeah. For folks who have already made the decision, what do they have to look forward to? Or what, what's the process going to be like? Well, I, I, would, I would first, uh, when you look at you know, what Netflix or Hulu or some of the other large OVPs have in common from a content operations perspective, uh, none of them have built out their architecture utilizing uh, hardware and software you know, encoders, commercial encoders. You know, what they have done is they use open source technologies, uh, containerized on uh, general purpose CPU, because uh, it, it allows them to scale rapidly and it allows them to deal with this, with the format wars and the ever-changing formats. If you are a content owner who has made that investment and you're migrating too, um, there are companies like Encoding.com who can help with that migration. And you move away from managing hardware software in-house to having developers managing APIs. Right, to our platform. Uh, and uh, you start looking at OpEx budgets instead of CapEx budgets. Um, but we basically alleviate the pain that you've been managing for the last 10 years. Now what about the, what about the work required to go through that transition? I mean, there's, it's not a magic bullet, right? Yeah, and, and um, oftentimes with the larger companies, you start dealing with it in phases, in certain workflows. So you don't go from you know, full uh, infrastructure investments to fully running and cloud-based services all at once. You migrate over time, and you start peeling off. Maybe it's HLS workflows, or maybe there's certain. You know, depends where your content is stored as well. If you've moved some of your content into the cloud storage already, like Akamai NetStore, well, then it makes a lot of sense to then be using, you know, moving all of your content operations for those workflows. So I think it's a migration that happens over time, um, and 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 frankly, I think companies that make that migration find that. Uh, the, the transcoding component of that overall migration when using somebody like Encoding.com is actually not that, you know, it's not that complex. It's, not that it's actually simpler Much. than, yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. makes sense. Now, uh, I, I tried to get you to, to prognosticate mm -hmm. and to talk about what the future of technology looked like, and you had a really great answer. Your answer was, that you're not in the business of prognostication, you're in the business of building reliable solutions on trusted technology. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. And and I remember when you asked me that, you know, uh, often analysts from Wall Street will reach out to me wanting to know the direction, you know, that our world's heading in, what formats, you know, and I and as I say to them, I said, encoding.com is actually the lagging indicator, right? Because by the time that we are supporting certain formats, that's because there's demands from the content owners. That means the devices have to support those codecs. And so you're going back like three years before, they, before it gets into market. Uh, HEBC and HLS, for example, that Apple supports now, we're just starting to see some real volume you know, moving through that. So uh, again, we, 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 uh, 
we wait until that demand before we build solutions for it because you can't guess. And we've guessed wrong in the past. And when I first um, joined my partner Greg, who started this company in October of 2008, and I joined in November of 2008, uh, when we were raising capital, investors early on were saying, well, isn't everyone just going to unify on Flash? And if you think that was 10 years ago, there's not a lot of Flash going on today. Right? Yeah, yeah, things yeah. change very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Right, it feels slow when it's happening, but as, as yeah. time goes on, it it's, uh, feels quite fast. Now, I actually wonder about the format wars and what your stance is on it. I know that Encoding.com has uh, published some content around the mm -hmm. format wars. Where do you think we are today in terms of format wars? I mean, we think that the HEVC in HLS will be is 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 going to be uh, drive a lot of volume in 2019. Um, it's hard to predict beyond that, to be honest. You know, you hear things like you know what's going on with AV1 and some other formats, but you know when you look at actually what uh, large media companies are pushing through encoding.com, um, you're not seeing a lot of that. You know, you, you, this year you started to see some more 4K. Uh, HDR, we believe, you know, is coming in 2019 as well. Uh, but I would say in the near term, we're looking at HEVC and HLS is, is, is probably what, uh, what we would be betting on. Yeah, now what I'm curious about is the next the next transformation. So in five years or eight years, when a new device launches, that introduces a new format or some new standard, yeah. you'll have a lot of companies sitting on VOD assets yeah. that have already been transcoded in a certain way, and you feel like the, the job is done, right? Yeah. But in well, eight years, yeah. you may have to do the whole thing all over again. Well, you, you might. There are ways to uh, mitigate that risk today. I mean, first of all, you want to uh, have a transcoding solution that will be flexible to support those formats as they change, number one, right? So in, in the case of encoding.com, we actually operate over 40, uh, 40 engines now, I was going to say 45, 40 engines underneath our hood that, uh, so we can support the maximum number of video formats, audio formats, caption formats, DRM, et cetera. So first you have to have a solution that can handle it. Now, uh, in the near term, um, we have a lot of our customers now transcoding into fragmented MP4 so that they can repackage for HLS or DASH or uh, moving around audio or different DRM later without having to retranscode those full libraries. So you can help mitigate the risk, the near term risk by doing things like that. By um, building, by uh, focusing on an intermediary format. Intermediary format, format like yeah. Fragments and MP4 for repackaging later. Um, when, a, and a, when a full new codec comes along, like HEVC, yeah, you will be retranscoding those libraries again. Yeah. yeah, I actually wonder as well about the relationship between live and VOD. I know you focus a lot on VOD, but uh, a typical broadcaster is not just a VOD company and not just a live company. There's a relationship between yeah. the live stream and the VOD assets. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, we all think of this very differently. Live is very different from VOD, right? Live linear, very operationally complex, uh, you know, stability, not five nines, et cetera. Whereas, but, but the formats, the variability of formats is minimal. You know, it's RTMP in, or MPEG transport streams in, HLS out. Uh, with VOD, you're dealing with many formats that you're ingesting, many different formats that you're producing. So it's much more uh, complex on the actual processing side, um, but you're not managing live streams. Right. Right. So you have some uh, flexibility there. Two very different, and I think that uh, media companies do consider those two very different solutions. In our case, while we do support live, we do focus on VOD, and the stuff that we do is we might ingest, or we do ingest live streams to convert them into me immediate VOD assets yep. for distribution. Um, but that's, that's where we play in the game. We find that VOD transcoding and packaging is very complex in and of itself, and that to be the best in the world at that which we believe we are, takes all of our focus and energy. Now that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I've actually talked to some live streaming companies and they admit that VOD is much more complex. You know, yeah, from of, that regard. But, yeah, I, but in, in the, the same formats, regard, yeah. I don't want to be hosting thousands of streams that are live and... Concurrent. Yes, yeah. concurrent, et cetera. I leave that up to you know guys like Akamai. And, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And, we, and by the way, we have a new partnership, I understand. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, so we've, we're working very closely together and uh, Akamai sees Encoding.com as a key partner when we deal with our customers, we recommend encoding.com as Thank a solution you. for transcoding. Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts yeah, on that. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we've been uh, working on this relationship for quite some time, yeah. and Akamai, I believe, had done a pretty extensive technical evaluation, commercial evaluation, and uh, I'm glad that encoding.com was a, a chosen partner. Uh, we are working very closely with the Akamai product team to ensure 
any customer who does want to migrate to using encoding.com for transcode and packaging, um, that it's a seamless and easy experience. And we uh, are utilizing Akamai presets, for example. So if you're very comfortable with what you're producing on Akamai today, you can produce those exact same outputs very simply using encoding.com. And we have deep integrations with Akamai NetStore already, so we can be ingesting your content or delivering back to Akamai. In fact, a majority of our large customers that we do transcoding for over the years, we're already dropping off tons of content in, in Akamai NetStore, right. as you would suspect. Which makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it just brings us a little closer, and yeah. uh, we're, we're very excited with the partnership. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm actually curious to hear a little bit about your origin story. So you've talked about being around for 10 years now. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how the company got started. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to say that, you know, uh, it's a brilliant idea, transcoding in the cloud, and I could say that because it wasn't my idea. Um, my partner, Greg Heil, uh, launched in October of 2008, and the reason that he built a transcoding service in the cloud at the time, uh, he had a, a small business where he was building um, CMS video platforms for customers, and transcoding was part of that, and he didn't want to manage the transcoding. He was buying servers and running them you know, on-prem, and just assumed that there was a, a service in market, a you know, cloud-based service in market, and when he looked to the market, there wasn't. And he had his, this aha moment. And very quickly, when I joined in November 2008, we were already selected in Coding.com. Uh, Amazon Web Services had this startup challenge. I think they, I don't know if they still do actually, but we were one of the finalists that year. And uh, very quickly, we had very large media companies utilizing our platform. And it was Netflix and MTV and ABC early on. And that, for us, was just very eye-opening that there must be a problem. If these guys are all digging in so quickly, there must be a problem. And there was, and it started with the format wars. How many companies would you say have not made the transition yet, have not made the decision to move from on-prem hardware software solutions to cloud-based transcoding? I actually think very, very few have not, very few have, have not already made a decision to start migrating to the cloud. Um, in fact, I don't know any who hasn't already made that decision. Yeah. S some are at very different phases of that migration. Mm -hmm. Some are dipping their toes in the water and some are fully neck deep. Um, you know, companies like you know, Viacom and Turner and Discovery have been at the forefront of leveraging cloud and moving and migrating content operations to the cloud. Others um, are a bit slower, but I, I don't, you know, whether or not, these companies are already using cloud for a lot of their services, right? Yeah. So I think uh, getting over the security hump and getting over the moving around of large files into the cloud, those are two issues that have slowly been going away. And, Many companies are moving a lot of their content to the cloud already for storage. On the security side, you know, security's gotten much, much better in the cloud over the last few years, and Amazon Web Services is you know, MPAA rated, and um, you know, there have been some issues of companies managing themselves their own content, you know, what happened with Sony a few years ago, and all of these things you know, add up to uh, an ease of comfort of, you know, of using cloud services. And um, I think as those continue to go away, those issues, more and more companies are migrating to the cloud. Yeah, what do you think is most surprising to companies who are in the middle of that transition? What, what do you think is most surprising to companies that are dealing with this transition right now, that have made the decision, they're in the middle of it? Uh, I think, you know, one of the, as it pertains to transcoding, yeah, yeah. I think that um, uh, some of it is um, really sort of, figuring out how much compute do I need to manage my volume. I'm used to, I have X number of servers on-prem that manages my load and queues back up, and I'm just, there's I'm a certain way of doing business where that no longer has to exist when you leverage the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you could light up a thousand servers concurrently if you need to to meet a very quick you know, SLA and turnaround. So I think there's, there's some change in thinking and strategy on compute utilization, uh, job orchestration. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about what does encoding.com really do, we, we do job orchestration in the cloud, right? We are compute arbitrage. We, we have all this compute over here, figuring out how to most efficiently manage compute to transcode content for our customers. And just that way of thinking is very different from what they're used to. So I think there's some change in thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, letting go of not seeing the, uh, you know, the, the, the lights right next to you oh, and the right, dials and right. knobs. And I think there has been some generational shift, yeah. you know, with that. There's a bit of a security blanket to being able to walk in, you know, open the door, there see is. the equipment there and say, look, there it is. It's, yeah, I think it's some old. media companies yeah. also, yeah. what they've struggled with is realizing now that they actually need a lot more developers 
on their video engineering teams, yeah. right? Not right. just broadcast engineers, but web developers, API right. integrations, right. et cetera. Yeah, it moves into a DevOps it, Correct, uh, and it's, that's, that's been an interesting shift, I think, for companies. Yeah, yeah. that is interesting. Uh, why did encoding.com choose to partner with Akamai? So we know why we chose to partner with encoding.com, because, in yeah. fact, you guys are a leader in, uh, in the space. Uh, why, why was the partnership logical for you? We have wanted to partner with Akamai ever since we launched this company. Uh, we have felt that there was a natural product fit. You know, the more bits that are being transcoded, the more bits that are being pushed through the network. Win-win yeah. for, you know, for both companies. And uh, we felt that we were targeting very similar companies, uh, at least in the you know, media and entertainment vertical. And so there were a lot of synergies there. And frankly, you know, all along Akamai, we have felt has been you know, it's been the leader in CDN, you know, ever since we've gotten into the business. So, uh, you know, we're honored and we're thankful that we've been able to pull this off. Now, I, I promise to not make you prognosticate, but sure. it's hard to resist as you walk around the show floor, you see how much has changed in the eight or nine years that you've been visiting, right? You, yeah. you said that you've been here uh, eight or nine, of the, uh, eight of the last nine years. Yeah. When you look around at the change and you look around at uh, old companies doing new things and new companies emerging, what, uh, what strikes you? You don't have to guess about the future, but what strikes sure. you about the, the broadcast media OTT business? I mean, the, the, the things we've been talking about, but the migration from offering hardware software solutions to services yeah. has been a major shift. I mean, even look at, you know, I know I think you'll be speaking with Harmonic later, yeah. um, and they've made a fantastic shift from just you know, selling hardware and software encoders and being a market leader in that to their VOS platform as an example, which is a software as, ser as a service for live linear and, you know, and VOD workflows. And that's one of many examples out there of uh, vendors that have listened you know, to <laughs> what their content you know, providers are, you know, the direction they wanted to move in. So I think that shift has been amazing to see these old school successful hardware some, you know, software companies migrating to offering services. Um, I feel like we were a leader in that and a pioneer, uh, a leveraging cloud, but it's been interesting to see that, yeah. um, for one. I think from a format perspective, um, you know, we really do see you know, HDR. It's, you know, it's, just this, it's always going to be gorgeous quality, you know, at, at as small amount, small file size as possible. HEVC was a great shift in that. Um, so we, we do think that that's, if I was prognosticating, I would, but I've been wrong before. Yeah. You know, last time I was asked this question, I just thought of this, by the way. Uh, many years ago, I was on a panel and someone asked a similar question and I, and I hadn't thought about it. And I said, you know, uh, at the time my daughter was six. She's 15 now, so it was nine years ago. And I said, you know, last night I was at, I was at home and um, she, at six years old, she knows that she's not supposed to be watching TV. And I walked into her room and she was lying on the floor with an iPad. I noticed she was watching SpongeBob on Netflix. And I said, honey, you know, you're not supposed to be watching TV. And she said, no, 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 it's Netflix. And I knew right then and there, and unfortunately I did not make the investment that I should have in Netflix. You know, but yeah. I think when I look to, a lot, a lot of what I see coming is I look to my daughter and her teenage friends and how they're using devices with video and, and how natural it is and how much video they're producing on a daily basis, um, which is mind blowing. Yeah. So the user generated content I think is going to continue to yeah. To, to, to drive the market. Yeah, and at the start of our conversation, we talked about why companies should or shouldn't have to care about formats, and end users shouldn't have to really care about, right? So the yeah. viewer yeah. just wants to have a great experience, right. and they don't need to care about whether their device is compatible with someone's service, no. they just want to watch. No, and they don't want to see a, uh, any buffering either, right? Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. Uh, and that was an interesting shift from broadcast to digital, right? Having to manage that. The user should not care, the content owner should not care. And that's yeah. our job. And the more successful we are, you know, they shouldn't. I don't think that uh, it's reasonable to expect uh, Adobe and Google and Microsoft and Apple and Disney and Netflix to all agree on a standardized format. It's just never yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And uh, as long as that's the reality, it's our job to simplify that challenge for our customers and the end users. Yeah, and the, and the end user, the viewers, are constantly changing as well, right? Like you, you talked about your daughter. My kids came to me one day and, and said that the light in the bathroom was broken. My son thought that the battery had run out, and my daughter literally thought that it was just rebuffering. That was her explanation That's for amazing. why there was no light. Yeah. That's a changed population, yes. right? That's a totally new audience. Yeah. You know, I don't know how, what about for your kids, but um, my daughter does not ever sit in front of the television in the living room. No, never. So they're consuming, you know, their video consumption habits are all the screen. Yeah. 
you know, and uh, and and you know, so it's funny when I, you know, some some companies try to push tremendously large, high quality content, but in the end, you have to continue to ask yourself, what's the device that end users is going to be viewing your content on, right? Right, because it's very expensive to be pushing, as you know, you know, very high quality video, you yeah. know, through through the network. So there's a, there's a lot of balance in that as well. Yeah, and even the the recognition that folks are going to be consuming over a mobile network, right? So That's you've true. got diff different network conditions, yeah. and particularly all over the world. Actually, my last question for you is, uh, obviously, uh, you and I both have American accents. Uh, I know your company has uh, offices in the U.S., but you've also got a, a really strong presence globally. Talk a little bit about that, particularly sure. for this global audience. Well, I mean, uh, we are a global operation. Yeah. Uh, we, Encoding.com runs in 15 different data centers around the globe. We also run in some large customer data centers. And uh, the ability to ingest and process content local to all these markets uh, is very important. You don't want to be sending content you know, all over the ponds and all over the place. You want to be able to process locally. Um, cloud automation, cloud services enables that. Uh, we do have an office in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, we have an office in New York as well. Uh, I've worked very hard to lose my New York accent in California over these years. Uh, but yes, we do. I mean, I, I would say, you know, uh, 33 to 40 percent of our business comes from outside the U.S. Yeah. Um, and from an operations perspective, we can support that, frankly, you know, by running uh, mostly in Amazon data centers. So Amazon has helped enable that. Yeah. That's great, Jeff. I really appreciate your yeah, time thank you very much. and you sharing yeah. your insight. And Akamai TV will be back streaming live.